Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's really, really a great pleasure to have on this Friday uh, Professor Irvin Weisman. He's, um, he was born in Great Fall in Montana. I think he's very proud of that. And he studied at Montana, University, at Montana State University. And from there, he moved to, to the other side. He moved to the Stanford University. He is the founding director of the Institute for Stem Cell Biology and Regenerative Medicine at the Stanford, director of the Stanford Ludwig Center for Cancer Stem Cell Research, and former director of the Stanford Cancer Center, as well as the immunology program. His research is in many, in many dif different aspects and issues of hematopoiesis, hematological malignancies, and solid tumors, and has been a, a, a driving force in the understanding of the stem cell population and, and functionality of all these uh, different models and entities. He was critical in the isolation and transplantation of pure hematopoietic stem cells, in the development of non-toxic antibody conditions for uh, transplantation. In AML, he created this idea that accumulation from one mutation to another, to the last mutation, finally give a leukemia. And this theory I like, that, I like very much about the don't eat me, signal used by leukemias to avoid uh, immune uh, innate immunity rea in reality and and using anti cd 47 blockade uh, excellent work that has led even to phase one clinical trials uh, that were remarkable in this in this case he is recognized in many ways um, member of national academy of science institute of medicine at the national academy the american association for arts of science and many recognitions just to mention a few, because we will have very short time, Robert Koch Award, Linus Pauling Medal, Passan Award, Max Delbrück Medal, the Brut Baker Prize, uh, uh, and recently the Albany Medical Center Prize with, with, Bert, with Bert Bogelstein. So uh, it's a great pleasure to have you here, uh, not for your awards, but for your research that is, has been critical for many researchers, young and, and mid-age and mid researchers, to develop their careers has been really great. The title of, of his talk is Normal and Neoplastic Stem Cells. Thank you very much, Manel. I, uh, I am so sorry not to be having this meeting in Barcelona. It is one of my favorite cities on earth. Thank you. So stem cell biology really is about the unit of organization that controls everything is the stem cell, not any single gene in the stem cell. So the mechanism of how hematopoiesis is regulated <clears throat> is by stem cells. This is the blood forming stem cell. It first comes up in development between the embryo to the fetal stage of development not only blood forming stem cells but separate brain forming stem cells intestine forming stem cells and so on so after the embryonic stages of mesoderm endoderm and ectoderm now you start organs you one time establish blood forming stem cells and then that population of stem cells that you started is responsible for the development of the blood forming system for its maintenance. And as I'll tell you, toward the end of the seminar, whenever you see something going wrong to cause a disease, whether it's a malignant disease, like acute myelogenous leukemia, or a blood disease, like myelodysplastic syndrome, you should think first that it might be blood forming stem cells that are doing it. So when we began the isolation of blood forming stem cells from bone marrow, we used monoclonal antibodies, each one of which might see a subpopulation of bone marrow cells. So we found right from the beginning that the blood forming stem cells have no markers of B cells, myelomonocytic cells, T cells, red cells, and so on. So we can make one set of fluorescent antibodies, all the same color, that see these lineage markers of forming blood and blood. Then we found markers that were present on the stem cells. So we'd have these markers positive, these negative. When we went to human, we found very similar markers that would allow us to isolate human blood forming stem cells as well. 
So now with those markers and with cell sorting capacity, we could take the blood forming tissue, which could be bone marrow, or as the clinicians know, a mobilization regimen to get stem and progenitors out of the bone marrow temporarily and into the blood. And what you can tell when you start with blood forming cells, let's say from a woman with metastatic breast cancer, she almost always has not only the blood forming stem cell, but cancer cells in the mix when you start. Or if you're a donor to your brother or sister, you have T cells that could make an immune reaction against the recipient. We wanted pure blood forming stem cells. When we found this method of isolation with cell sorting, we reduced, for example, breast cancer cells or T cells 250,000 fold. So now we could use the markers on mouse or human blood forming stem cells to do pure blood forming stem cell transplants. Here is our first clinical trial with blood forming stem cells. We had women who had metastatic or already sp spread breast cancer. And in the 1990s, people were giving very high dose combination chemotherapy, for example, cisplatin, cytoxin, carmustin, not at the dose that's sublethal but at the dose, which would be lethal. And when you increase the dose, you increase the number of cancer cells in the body that you kill. So now you wanna know, did you kill enough? And the popular treatment at that time was to get mobilized blood out before you started the chemotherapy. Then you give the chemotherapy, you thaw the frozen mobilized blood, and rescue the woman. In the overall study that we did, median survival was only a little over two years with cancer contaminated mobilized blood. By 150 months, everybody was either dead or still had their breast cancer. However, when we transferred purified blood forming stem cells, we found that the median survival, same patients, same doctors, same treatment, but now you give back cancer-free, the median survival was 10 years. And now 21 to 23 years later, we're able to find the patients that we treated and of the ones rescued with cancer-free stem cells, one third are alive without any evidence of their breast cancer. So that means they never went to a doctor to be treated for breast cancer again. The fact that we had extended the survival from two years to 10 years, we could calculate from the fraction of mobilized blood cancer contamination that probably after chemotherapy, there were only about 100,000 cancer cells in the whole body. So now we have a situation where we're curing many more breast cancer cells if it's used, and the opportunity to consolidate that therapy with drugs or antibodies or killer T cells or whatever. But the problem, was the company that I started that we isolated the stem cells was purchased by a large pharma, which said, we're gonna do everything <clears throat> that you wanted to do with stem cells. But as its leadership changed at about this time in our clinical trial, where there was a clear difference, they shut everything down that was stem cells in a business decision. And we should not be surprised that businesses make business decisions. We shouldn't blame them. We should now think of ways that we can do these kind of trials <clears throat> before we sell or allow large companies to take care of it. 
Now, in order to understand the biology of blood forming stem cells better, we began to develop a method where we could look at the gene expression of candidate cells. And we asked our computer to look at the gene expression and be able to look at blood forming stem cells in purple here in this little diagram. So that's stem cells, that's megakaryocyte erythrocyte progenitors, that's granulocyte macrophage progenitors, that's common lymphocyte progenitors, and these are all of the stromal cells in bone marrow that can support hematopoiesis. It turns out of all the genes that we looked at, <clears throat> the only one that has this property is HOXB5. So we made mice that have HOXB5 driving three copies of the fluorogenic protein M cherry. We needed three copies because gene expression from HOXB5 is very low, low level. It's a transcription factor, as you know. So now we look at what we formerly thought were pure stem cells. They're CKIT positive, lineage negative, uh, uh, SCA positive, and so on. The ones that have high levels of M cherry or low levels or negative levels. And therefore, 60% of the cells that we thought were stem cells do not express HOXB5. So now we could sort the HOXB5 positive, KIT, LIN, SCA, 34 minus, et cetera, and transplant them into a radiated host. When we did that, the HOXB5 negative subset gave short-term multi-lineage engraftment in some but not all the animals. The low levels gave multi-lineage engraftment in virtually all of them and all lineages. And when it had higher levels, same cell dose, 5, 10, 50 stem cells, you get all of them. Now, the important thing about stem cells is their self-renewal. So we wait four, six, eight months, and we remove the stem cell, the bone marrow, and transplant the original donor bone marrow cells into a secondary irradiated host. And now we get robust engraftment in the secondary. This is the secondary from both HOXB5 high and HOXB5 low, but not HOXB5 negative. It's important to note that even the HOXB5 negative, although they don't make all lineages, the lymphocytes they make can have a prolonged lifespan because there are things called memory T and memory B lymphocytes. Just remember that. So once we have a marker specific for stem cells, we could ask, where are they in the bone marrow? And to our surprise, when we stained all of the blood vessels in the bone marrow green with an antibody to blood vessel, and we look for those little red M cherry positive cells, 94% of them are attached to these ballooned sinusoids of the blood vessels or to the venous blood cells that lead to or come back from these sinusoids. Despite the claims by many others that blood forming stem cells were next to the bone or next to the artery. We suspect, but we don't know that that will be uh, the cells that were HOXB5 negative. So the important thing is you see only 100 such cells or niches in a whole mouse femur. And you see one cell per niche. You don't see doublets, even though 5% of them are in cell cycle. So the take home lesson for this is there are a limited number of specific niches for stem cells. And we so far with this marker only see one stem cell for niche. So we think that each of these niches are open to stem cell competition. 20 years ago, we showed 
that if you put mice into what's called parabiosis to share a circulation for several weeks and then separate them at a constant rate, a small number of bone marrow cells in one stem cells go into the blood, into the other animal, and compete for the stem cell niche. So you, even though you only see one stem cell per niche, the constant circulation of stem cells could provide them if, for example, a niche died. So once we isolated the stem cell and we had the markers for mouse or human stem cells, we could begin, and that's this group of people down here, looking for multipotent progenitors or the common myeloid or the common lymphoid progenitors and each of the steps. And we found the markers they do. And you could write this down, HTTP gene expression commons dot recon dot JP Japan. One of my fellows, Jun Seda, took it to Japan. And if you go into that site, you can type in the name of any gene you're interested in, like HOXB5, and see in all of these cell types, which ones express it, which ones don't. The most important point here is that between the long-term stem cell and the multipotent progenitor, both of them <clears throat> can give rise to all blood cells but only the stem cell self-renews. So the secret for stem cell self-renewal is within those highly purified one in 100,000 bone marrow cells that are HOXB5 positive. And the HOXB5 negative cells, as I showed you, give rise to all blood cells, but don't self-renew. So somewhere there is that secret. So now we could begin looking at <clears throat> the populations of stem cells. And back in 2000, the early 2000s, maybe 2005, we found that in mice and a little later in humans, that most of the blood forming stem cell in a two month old mice expressed genes of both lymphocyte transcription factors and myeloid gene transcription factors. As a mouse ages two years old or a 70 year old human, you have about three times the number of stem cells, but they mainly or only express the myeloid genes, not the lymphoid genes. So given that, we could do some studies. And one of the studies we did is to show this upon transfer, the myeloid biased old stem cells only are myeloid biased in primary and secondary transplants, <clears throat> where the balanced give rise to balanced output of lymphoid and, and, and myeloid cells. The highest expression transcription factors in the old myeloid cells, 17 out of the top 32 are genes that are translocated or mutated in human acute myelogenous leukemia. So the question we had is, is this transition from balanced to myeloid biased because that you have both populations there and the balanced ones are favored in the young environment, whereas the myeloid ones in the old person or old mouse's environment, or is there an epigenetic change to change the gene transcription? Now we don't have that absolutely worked out, but we found last year, 15 years after we had that, that a gene that is a neural cell surface neuron axon guidance protein is also expressed on long-term stem cells, much less on multipotent progenitors, and then not at all in early progenitors, in young. As the mouse ages, more and more of them are neogenin-1 positive. So you go from low uh, neogenin in young to very large numbers in old. And when we, when Shishtaf Zad, Gunsagar Galato, Joseph No, and I did the transplantation, the young ones, the neo one negative, give rise to more lymphocytes than myeloid cells, and the neo one positive give rise to more myeloid than lymphoid cells. 
So you switch the balance. It's true in humans, not this is not neogenin, but this is the number of long-term stem cells, Wendy Pang and I showed uh, quite a while ago, that you have equal numbers of myeloid and lymphoid, essentially, in young, but myeloid more than lymphoid in old. So that comes up with a hypothesis that the young green stem cells that can make balanced outcome are abundant in young, but rare in old. Not gone, but rare. Whereas the ones that dominate late in life, myeloid biased, are rare in young, but abundant in old. These other colors are to say there are probably megakaryocyte biased and other types of biased cells in there. We think that they are intrinsic and that this is a clonal selection of the cells that are appropriate for the microenvironment at the time. But one of the things that occurred to us is that the old myeloid bias cells only make maybe 1% or less of new lymphocytes with new T cell receptors or new B cell antigen receptors, immunoglobulin, whereas the, the balanced ones made thousands of them every day. I told you before that lymphocytes, T and B cells, when they're stimulated by antigen, antigen make a clone of cells, a subset of which are memory cells that last for life. So if you think back 10,000 years ago before trains, planes, and cars, all animals, including humans, would encounter microbes, make lymphocyte immune responses, but when they're old, they no longer make enough new lymphocytes. They don't need to because the microbes that they encountered in their own environment were now susceptible to the immune response, the adaptive immune response that would rapidly take care of them. But HIV, Zika, Ebola, MERS, SARS, COVID-19 are pathogens that come by travel. Young people can make an immune response that's effective. But we predict, and we think this is the problem, old people can make lots of myeloid cells, some of which will cause inflation, Inflammation, I mean, as they go forward. So you get what I'm saying, that the situation would be wonderful if we could eliminate all of the myeloid bias cells in an old person to see whether the balanced cells could reoccupy all of the stem cell niches. We're trying to test that now. Now, by knowing the phenotype, the markers on cells that are, for example, stem cells, are multipotent progenitors, we could test what John Dick, Dominique Bonnet, and Tsvi Lapatat proposed. They proposed that human acute myelogenous leukemia is part of the primitive population of cells, the leukemia stem cell. Back in 2000, we showed that in fact, the leukemia stem cell for all of the human acute myelogenous leukemias that we studied, for example here, the AML1 EDO translocation acute leukemias that came up in Hiroshima 5, 10, 15 years after the atomic bomb, that the leukemia stem cells with a particular translocation breakpoint are the leukemia stem cells and we can transfer them and Ravi Majedi and I've gone on to show this is true for all adult human acute leukemias. But as Manal said, we noticed that every one of those patients had some hematopoietic stem cells with the same breakpoint translocation. So that told us that a self-renewing cell that undergoes a genetic change that could lead to leukemia are not leukemic with that first change, 
but can give rise to leukemia stem cells that don't have to reside in the stem cell niche that give rise to the leukemia. <clears throat> so we propose from this and other studies that we've done with other leukemias that mutations and translocations can occur, of course, in any cell. But if it happens in the one in 100,000 cells in the bone marrow that's a blood-forming stem cell, it has the capacity by its self-renewal to make a clone that accumulates a second event or a third event. So that if we get an acute leukemia and isolate the stem cells, we should have a mixture. The dominating one would be the ones that have all seven mutations that are leukemic, but you should have some that have only six or five or four or three. So this says there are stepwise rare events that give rise to leukemia. By the way, the leukemia stem cells still try to make blood and those cells that are in the granulocyte and monocyte series, granulocyte, monocyte, progenitor, granulocyte only, monocyte, have markers of it. But those blast cells, which are 95% of the cells in the leukemia, are not themselves leukemic. By changing their epigenetic state, they're not leukemic. But these rare leukemia stem cells are. So here's that experiment that we looked at first. Here's the experiment we done. We isolated here in patient 70 from the Stanford Hospital, their leukemia. We did exome sequencing with Steve Quake, Ravi Majetti, and I. We found all of these genes were mutated, and only four of the 21 mutations were ones that increased the frequency of the blood-forming stem cell that had it. So it was easy to see that first mutation, which was a loss of function of TET2. Any bone marrow we looked at had it, so it wasn't just the first cell that had it, but its clone of daughter cell. That clone later gave rise to a cell that had a mutation in the second TET2, loss of function. And the third mutation, for sure, was a mutation in CTCF, which is part of the transcription complex. And this is a mutation in the DNA binding site where sets the start site of transcription. The mutation that everybody thought, when I asked them what mutation would be first, the mutation that classifies the leukemia here, an internal tandem repeat of FLT3 or RAS or uh, um, uh, MYC or beta catenin, those are always the last mutation. And those are always factors that drive the proliferation of the cells. Now, these proliferating cells are at the downstream progenitor stage, as I told you. So the niche seems to control this. The mutations that are beginning mutations, TET2, DNMT3A, isocitric dehydrogenase 1 and 2, are mutations in genes that either open or close chromatin. So when you go from a stem cell to a multipotent progenitor, normally you have to open chromatin for genes that are closed and close chromatin for ones that are open. All of them, of those early mutations, tend in every cell proliferation to self-renew. So this is the state in leukemia. When Wendy Pang and I looked at myelodysplastic syndrome, a disease where you don't have enough platelets or red cells or neutrophils, a disease that is onset is in old people and therefore from the myeloid bias stem cells, when we look at their purified stem cells, 98% of the stem cells, no matter which chromosomal event led to myelodysplastic syndrome, 
They were the only stem cells, are almost the only stem cells in the body. And they no longer make T cells or B cells or NK. And the progenitors they make for erythroid or myeloid or megakaryocytic are cells that are removed by the macrophages in the blood forming system. Knowing that, Sid Jaswal and Ben Ebert, looking at the blood of people aged, showed that the very first step, TET2, DNMT3A, ASXL1, whatever it is, that is a driver mutation, expands those cells at the expense of normal stem cells, and that is clonal hematopoiesis. Those people don't know they have a disease, but they have a high incidence of completing the mutations to go to MDS or leukemia. And shockingly, found by Jaswal and Ebert, they have the highest incidence of atherosclerosis for anything except smoking, high fat diet. So what this is telling us that something funny is going on and there's crosstalk between the blood forming system and the blood vessel system. So if there's nothing else you remember, what we've shown with human leukemias is that although there are Many, many oncogenes people have found over the years that if you put them in the blood forming system could cause leukemia. In fact, by studying the leukemias themselves, we see only a subset of the events occur. They occur in, this, in a particular order and that the leukemia stem cells are in the multipotent progenitor stage. We cannot and have not found a leukemia of the leukemia of the HSC, the hematopoietic stem cell stage. And now here is the most important point that we are working on very hard, that mutations don't know they should just be in the blood forming system. They don't know whatever causes mutation that should be only in the hematopoietic stem cells to cause leukemia. They occur everywhere. Every tissue that has tissue stem cells that self-renew could therefore accumulate mutations in that reservoir. So we predict that all cancers that come from tissue stem cells will have most of their development in the tissue stem cell. And that the clonal competition by the precancerous stem cells can lead to diseases caused by mutational changes or epigenetic changes in the dominant clone. And we're testing that. So I know I've taken a little longer, but I want to show you a little more of what you can learn from stem cells. Way back in 1998, David Traver and I did the first gene expression between mouse acute myelogenous leukemia stem cells and mouse hematopoietic stem cells, we found CD47. And then Sid Jaswal, the same one who did clonal hematopoiesis when he was a medical student with me, Robin Majetti, Mark Chow, and I found exactly the same in human leukemia. CD47 is upregulated in the leukemia stem cell. And CD47, Oldenburg and Lindbergh had shown was an age marker on red cells. As it faded away from young red cells, because you don't make new proteins, macrophages could sense it was going away and they could eat them. So it determined the age, the lifespan of red cells. And we proposed, they proposed, that there would be an eat me signal that was being countered by this don't eat me signal. So we tested the hypothesis because we found it in leukemias that if we could block the interaction between the leukemia stem cell and the macrophage that has a receptor for the don't eat me signal, this is called SERP alpha, signal inducing receptor protein alpha. We now know that that uh, interacts when 
when the CD47 interacts with the receptor, the ITIM motif in the cytoplasm brings in SHP1 and possibly SHP2 tyrosine phosphatases. And that activation of those tyrosine phosphatases dephosphorylate the cytoskeleton of macrophages so they can't engulf the cell to which they attach if that cell has the don't eat me segment. Making antibodies that block the interaction, we've done anti-SERP and anti-CD47, we found that human acute myelogenous leukemia stem cells that we isolate directly from the patient bone marrow and human macrophages, that if we block CFSE green labeled leukemia stem cells with anti-CD47, they're eaten by the macrophages. But if we block it with another antibody called anti-CD45, you wash away the green cells, the macrophages are empty. Here we look at two different blocking antibodies and they both cause the eating or phagocytosis of all of these Stanford leukemia patients, no matter what the initial CD47 level was, but they don't cause eating of normal hematopoietic stem cells or normal bone marrow. But an antibody that binds to the CD47 and does not block, called 2D3 in mice, does not block the interaction and does not lead to phagocytosis. So we went through a whole bunch of preclinical studies and I'll say in California, we were able to form a team that made this discovery about the CD47 system at the university, the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine funded by the state allowed us not only to make the discovery but to do all preclinical and even phase one clinical trials paid for by the state. And that means we could see if this was going to work. We could see in non-human primates that have the same CD47 if the antibodies would cause any toxicity. And the answer was we could get to a safe dose with no loss of anything dangerous. And if we treat patients with myelodysplastic syndrome or elderly people who just got acute myelogenous leukemia, both of these diseases, at least before we started our trial, are universally fatal. No therapy will work. All of the patients with myelodysplastic syndrome and almost all of the patients with acute myelogenous leukemia have a shrinking of the tumor cells or a shrinking of the myelodysplastic cells. If we combine anti-CD47 with a non-curative azacitidine, which by the way, we showed increases the eat me signal on leukemia, but not normal cells. This is a fantastic result, of course, and very gratifying that we could do it mainly uh, at a non-commercial entity. And then, of course, our university and everybody else caused us to take it out commercially and eventually to a company that could do large-scale clinical trials. CD47 is on all cancer cells. The successful treatment in some but not all patients with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma the many subtypes, depends on rituximab, which is an anti-CD20 antibody. It has human IgG1 as the isotype, and as Jeff Ravitch and others have shown, the high affinity FC receptor for that IgG1 is a phagocytic receptor in macrophages, just like it's a killing receptor on natural killer cells. All of the studies that we did leading up to the trial were to take patient leukemia cells or lymphoma cells, put them into an immune deficient mouse and then test the agent. The immune deficient mouse we choose, NSG, has no NK cells. Yet we saw effective treatment of lymphoma with rituximab alone, a little bit, with anti-CD47 alone. And when we combined the two, we had a synergistic activity 
on lymphoma. So in a clinical trial <clears throat> led by Mark Chow and Chris Takamoto, now at a company called Gilead, which bought the first company, patients who were relapsed and refractory to rituximab or chemotherapy, Ranjana Advani led the trial that showed that half of them go into a remission and a total of maybe 35% of them are long-term remissions with a combination. But of course, they had already failed rituximab. So we wanted to know what was the eat me signal that differentiated normal stem cells that might upregulate CD47 from being killed by the programmed cell removal of macrophage eating when you block CD47? And Mark Chow, Sid Jaswal, and Rachel Sukumoto Wiseman found it was calreticulin. <clears throat> and I won't go into a lot about calreticulin because I want to finish my talk. But I can say that calreticulin is on the surface of all the cancer cells that we've looked at, all of the leukemias. It is, of course, possibly made by the leukemia cell itself or the cancer cell itself. But we found that it also is made by the activated macrophages that are having the surveillance function for old red cells or dangerous cells like cancer cells. The triggering of the toll-like receptors leads to their activation and in a BTK, Bruton tyrosine kinase dependent fashion, they clip off the KDEL carboxy terminus of calreticulin and it's released to the secretory pathway where we showed, Denon Wang showed with us, it binds to the acyaloglycans that are on cancer cells in abundance, but not in normal cells in abundance. So this appears to be a surveillance system where activated macrophage is triggered by the DNA or RNA from dying cells or LPS or other activation turn on the secretion of this eat me signal. And if it sticks to a cell, they use another receptor, which is by the way, LRP1, also called CD91, to eat those cells. By the way, in our patient-derived xenografts, cancer stem cells, breast cancer stem cells, were treated very well also. It doesn't work perfectly in humans, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But the main point I want is, I want you to remember back to the cancer-free stem cell rescue in women with metastatic breast cancer, where at least in that small trial, we cured a third of the women. And the other two thirds had only about 100,000 cancer cells left in the body. So this is one of the kinds of consolidation therapies that we hope to explore in the near future. I'll just say for the molecular biologists in the crowd, Paula Bettenker and I have shown that all of the luminal A type breast cancers, if you now look at the CD47 gene itself, the upregulation of the expression of CD47, the gene, occurs because one motif in what we call enhancer five that is normally poised as here we're looking in a lymphoma cell line, is massively upregulated, precipitable weight with H3K27 acetyl. And this cell and all of its daughter cells epigenetically, not mutation, but epigenetically are now committed to high levels of CD47. So you can imagine in a breast cancer, especially in an inflammatory breast cancer, the cells that can come in and take care of these cells if they don't have high levels of CD47 uh, now can't because the CD47 level is high. That motif has an NF-kappa B motif in it. 
And when Paola removed the bit, this in an experimental breast cancer cell line, the NF-kappa B, the levels went back to the poison enhancer. So here, cells of the immune system that make TNF-alpha and breast cancer cells that have the TNF-alpha receptor can now activate NF-kappa B to go from the cytoplasm to the nucleus. And if they hit this enhancer, if this is in sufficiently open chromatin, now you upregulate the expression of CD47. And by the way, for those cancers that are HER2 positive, Trastuzumab, which is Herceptin, synergizes with anti-CD47, whereas Trastuzumab or CD47 alone, given for short time points, slows or lessens the tumor cell, but then they start to grow back. So this we will do in another clinical trial. Now, when we went back and looked at our mouse system and our human system, we found that macrophages that have receptor proteins with ITIM motifs, their ectodomains can be a don't eat me segment. And we found that SERP alpha has a response to the don't eat me signal of CD47. PD1 is present on macrophages in PDL1 positive tumors. It's a don't eat me signal. If the tumor um, expresses MHC class 1 beta 2 microglobulin, another item motif, LI, LRB1 delivers that don't eat me signal. And as Amira Barkle showed, also on, she worked on these. CD24, which is highly abundant on breast cancers and ovarian cancers, can be a don't eat me signal. So we have this whole set of don't eat me signals and their receptors. And we've looked at several tumors and we find some of them CD47 is the dominant, some CD24 is the dominant, some they're co-dominant. So we believe as this field evolves and we add more and more combinations of antibodies that block the don't eat me signals will improve the outcome on those cancers. Years ago, I wondered whether patients with sustained production of HIV that have AIDS pretty much under control by drugs, if perhaps the persistently infected cells express CD47 and Mike McCune and I showed that was true. So we went on to look at other intracellular infections. And I'll just say in work with Kim Hasenkrug and Laura Myers, Michal told in my lab, those people in, in, in uh, the Rocky Mountain Lab of the National Institutes of Allergy, infectious disease, all intracellular infections, friend virus, LCMV, lacrosse virus, and bacterial infections, Lyme disease, Borrelia, Salmonella, and even COVID, uh, SARS CoV 2 or 19, the current pandemic, they all increase in the intracellular infected cells CD47. So we showed that if you block those, you get cross presentation and both macrophage and effector T cell elimination in the mouse models, and we're looking forward to studying them in other systems. So that says that both cancer cells and infected cells can be protected by the don't eat me signal. Gerlinda Wernig and I began looking at a bone marrow syndrome called myelofibrosis. Myelofibrosis, about half of the patients that have it have an activating mutation of the JAK2 kinase. The other half, by the way, have a mutation in calreticulin that causes secretion of the cleaved calreticulin. We looked at the nucleus of patients with pulmonary fibrosis and myelofibrosis and found they all had C. June in their nucleus whereas normal fibroblasts didn't. 
So we made CGUN inducible with tetracycline, and within a few weeks, these healthy mouse lungs were full of inflammatory cells and fibroblasts. The current drugs lessen it a little bit, and ICD-47 lessens a little bit, but the dangerous fibroblasts in this disease in mouse and in human make and secrete IL-6. You have a highly inflammatory condition, and you can take a myeloid, I mean a fibrosis at this stage, a few days before death, and get back to a viable situation, not perfect, just by anti-47 and anti-IL-6. The same with peritoneal adhesions, which are fibroblast accumulations. The last disease I'll talk about is a complete surprise. Nick Leeper and I began collaborating about five years ago when he did the gene expression analysis of human atherosclerotic plaques and found that they had upregulated CD47. And together we show there is an expansion of smooth muscle cells in the plaque. And they express CD47. They have calreticulin on their surface. And that TNF-alpha and CD47 are part of that plaque. If you give anti-CD47, and you look at those macrophages in the plaque, here are the cells that just died. Mac, they are still CD47 positive, excuse me. So macrophage eating of dead cells is called epherocytosis. And our antibody treatment got rid of the necrotic cores in mice with APOE deficiency and pretty massive atherosclerosis. So we got rid of the apoptotic cells and they were eaten by the macrophages. Down here, we showed with our rainbow mouse, this is a mouse where you give tamoxifen once and now each cell in the body gets one of 16 colors and all of its daughter cells have the same color fluorescent protein. Every plaque that we see developing in these mice this is the aortic leaflet, where you have high turbulence and an induction of um, atherosclerotic plaques, are reduced by anti-CD47. Everyone is a clone of a, coming from a single cell. And if we block the function of TNF and 47 together, we reduce the size of the plaque and open up the blood vessel. So we have programmed cell removal of the viable cells that are CD47 positive, but are in a clone that makes a plaque, and also the dead cells uh, via epherocytosis. Uh, if I have five or 10 more minutes, I'll assume I do because we started late, I want to finish with this. Almost all of the bone marrow transplants that the bone marrow transplant clinics treat are for cancer. And so they do not bother getting rid of the T cells that's in the bone marrow or the mobilized blood. The T cells that would reject a skin graft from the recipient on the donor reject the skin of the recipient if you co-infuse them with stem cells. And the ones that would kill the lung cells, kill the lung. This is graft-versus-host disease. And you have the art of bone marrow transplant in cancer patients is to have immunosuppressants that you give, which increase the risk of secondary cancers and fungus and bacteria, but save many lives nevertheless. But let's say that your recipient is somebody who took a drug and they got aplastic anemia or they have sickle cell anemia, or they have an autoimmune disease where their T cells that are dangerous against self have not been deleted during thymic development or post-thymic T cell action. You don't need the T cells for any of those diseases, but you do need healthy blood-forming stem cells. 
So we've shown in mouse to mouse and human to what's called a skid you mouse that has the whole human blood forming and immune system from fetal remains that we get no graft versus host disease, that they're permanently tolerant of any organ or tissue from the donor, and that it reverses autoimmune disease. This is quick. This is the autoimmune disease of type 1 diabetes. You transplant them following a radiation, you buy a month as you kind of decrease the set point. If you give back their own NOD, diabetes prone hematopoietic stem cells, you buy another month, but it comes back. This is as far as the bone marrow transplant community has gone. We published this study in 2001, because if you give donor stem cells that are not diabetogenic, even from MHC matched donors that have non mutant genes for the diabetes prone locus, you cure them if you give it before the diabetes is complete. You cure it after the diabetes is complete by co transplanting blood forming stem cells and insulin producing islets from the same donors. That's fantastic. Why has it been not adopted? by the bone marrow transplant community? The simplest answer I could say is, the irradiation or chemotherapy give you unacceptable morbidity and mortality to a child at the first onset of diabetes or somebody in their 20s to 40s who gets lupus. So we said, let's get rid of irradiation and chemo and let's see if we can eliminate all of those cells with antibodies. So Anishka Chekovic, Dita Bhattacharya, Dan Kraft, and I showed in mice that are immune deficient that the anti-CKIT antibody that blocks CKIT signaling by KIT ligand can remove enough stem cells that the transplant of 5,000 stem cells now gives you 15% chimerism instead of those not treated with the antibody, 1% but 15%, which will allow for the cure of, of uh, lymphoid deficiencies because you keep expanding those, is not enough for everything else. So we remembered that anti-C kit could bind to the phagocytic receptor and we might get a synergy. So when people in Judy Shizuru's lab and ours did this, we showed if you add anti-C kit to anti-CD47, you greatly increase the number of stems of hematopoietic stem cells that are removed, and that transplant, instead of giving low level, give high level chimerism, which cures their skid. We then moved quickly to matched transplants, MHC matched, because that's the standard of care in bone marrow transplant. And there we found that we had antibodies the T cells, as well as anti-C kit, as well as anti-CD47, that whole combination is required to be able to allow pure, safe, MHC match, but different donor, B10D2 to valve, both H2D, full engraftment. But as you know, only 25% of the SIBs will have an HLA match. And families now, with an average of two children, have a low likelihood that you'll find a, a donor for that recipient. So Benson George and I said, well, let's move to haplotransplants or even unrelated donor to host. So we did that. And of course, now you're working in a system where not only T cells are important, but natural killer cells. And to make a long story short, with six antibodies, anti-CK, anti-CD47, anti-CD4, anti-CD8, anti-NK122, plus blocking CD40 ligand, with those antibodies alone, given in a single dose, haplo donor, AKI by black, transplants of purified stem cells developed by black, 
gave rise to engraftment. We then transplanted them with hearts from the stem cell donor or a third party. The hearts took in the stem cell donor, not the third party. They were chimeras for life, and they maintain the transplants now for two years. So in a single dose of antibodies with no radiation and no chemo in mice, we can, for regenerative medicine purposes, transplant stem cells and co-transplant or organs as well. So what I've told you is the future coming from stem cell biology is that you get rid of radiation and cytotoxic drugs in the regenerative medicine part of bone marrow transplant. You get rid of the recipient stem cells, T cells, and NK cells. You transplant them with donor MHC, uh, HSC that have no T cells, therefore they cannot cause graft versus host disease. And that should allow the treatment of all the autoimmune diseases I talk about, the treatment of diseases like sickle cell, thalassemia, and so on. And just so that you don't always have to have a donor around, the long distant future, the bet on being able to do embryonic stem cell or induced pluripotent stem cell isolation and growth and differentiation will be to get blood forming stem cells and say brain forming stem cells from the same cell line. So you can read this while uh, I, I reach the end, we have questions, but just think back, stem cell biology is a different way of thinking. The ultimate mechanism, the irreducible mechanism is the cell, not any particular gene in the cell. It is as mechanistic science as is the molecular biology of CRISPR-Cas9, for example. So we need to isolate and transplant pure stem cells of each type. I haven't gone into, but we did a whole bunch of things by isolating human fetal brain stem cells and show that they were in spinal cord injury and a number of other cell loss, neural cell loss diseases but you have to give those patients immunosuppression for life or else they lose their transplant. Cancer stem cells do exist and they are the unit of spread of the cancer. And they have upregulated don't eat me signals which allow us to study this disease. The kinds of processes that lead to the development of a cancer stem cell from its tissue stem cell can lead to other pathogenic cells. So I would say, this is a major opening to understanding and treating common incurable diseases, and this is not small molecule therapy. I'm so sorry all of the glitches and how long I talked took so long, so I'm happy to take questions. I hope you were there for my talk. Hello? Now. now, now I hear you. So, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. It has been it has been really wonderful, intense and wonderful, I will say. And uh, because I don't want to take out of your time, just four questions, uh, very short, um, because there are many. So I have to select a few of those questions here. One relates to. Uh, a lot of the genes that are mutated in leukemia, like TED, DMTs, IDH1 and, and 2, they are metabolic related. What about the metabolism and, and hematopoietic stem cells? Yes. So, Robert Signer and Sean Morrison are amongst the leaders in understanding the metabolomics of hematopoietic stem cells. And they've shown many remarkable things. Uh, Sean was my graduate student many years ago, and I'd like to say the reason we didn't follow metabolomics is because we wanted to be gracious and let Sean do the studies. 
But the honesty is Sun is a very formidable competitor. So it was smart of us to step back and watch him do those wonderful studies. Excellent. The other is, um, you said that there are no leukemias that are leukemias of hematopoietic stem cells. But there are these leukemias that they are acute and differentiated leukemias without lymphoid or myeloid. This can be an exception or what was going on there? Yeah, so there, what one wants to do is look at the leukemia stem cell. Now, we agree that the lymphomas are the B cell lineage, childhood acute lymphocytic lineage, adult chronic lymphocytic, they're B cell lineage. So we don't know if the driver mutations in those cells occur in the TRB cell that is capable of forming memory TRB cells, therefore self-renewal. It, it could be a mix of some hematopoietic stem cell ones that set the stage by clonal hematopoiesis for the other mutations at the B cell lineage somewhere to give rise to the tumor. But I think that's there. There are some bilineage leukemias. As you know, chronic myelogenous leukemia can give you a myeloid or a lymphoid blast crisis. And that fits with the idea that the driver mutations are in the hematopoietic stem cell with that kind of capacity, and that the downstream cell is still one that has the genes that could have taken you to lymphoid, but we don't know why it does or doesn't. So I would say a careful dissection in every one of these diseases of the nature of the leukemia stem cell and then its genetics, epigenetics, and so on would help reveal it. Just like I'll propose that colorectal cancers come from an intestinal stem cell that forms the adenoma. Or that, for example, for IDH1 and 2, they are also present in glioblastomas. See, we are, te we are testing whether the neural stem cell that can give rise to the glial population is the one that accumulates IDH and other uh, track or other mutations that are involved in this disease. Thank, thank you. Uh, another question. Could the myeloid bias of H hematopoietic stem cells be reverted if you transplant this to a young mice? We did that and it isn't reverted. Not if it's pure myeloid bias cells. So we had markers for it and we could transplant them. But as I said, the other way to do it would be to eliminate all of the myeloid bias because they express high level CD150, they express neogen in one. So you could conceive of ways that you would test it to see if the few residual balanced hematopoietic stem cells can now lead to a balanced system with many new lymphocytes coming in. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, here I have another. Mm, the idea of competitive dynamic niche versus static location of stem cells, can you confirm it using intravital microscopy? That's exactly the way we're trying to do it now. Uh, as you know, in any academic institution, you depend on your collaborators or neighbors to provide systems where, like intravital microscopy, that you can follow it. And of course, then you have to convince somebody who works in your lab, a student or a fellow, to do it. So we are now set up to do it. We hope to do it, of course. We have to get rid of the bone because all of the intravital microscopy can't see through a bone, as far as I know. Okay. Two more questions, I will let you go. Uh, one is, why are the TED, TED and 23 mutations so common in age, in aged um, hematopoietic stem cells? Bec so, as I said, the TET, IDH, DNMT3, those kinds of mutations accumulate at a slow rate. 
So the older you are, the higher the chance that you have one of those mutants. TET2 leading to clonal, a uh, loss of function leading to clonal hematopoiesis really occurs mainly in people over 60 or 70 or 80 years old to get clonal hematopoiesis. So I think it's a, a statistical function, not that myeloid bias stem cells or balanced stem cells are more or less likely to have the TET2 mutation. That's a loss of function. Yeah. And, and the last one. So how do you see uh, the CAR therapy fitting with transplantation of hematopoietic stem cells? Say that again. How, how do you see the, the CAR T cell therapy ah. fitting with the uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation? So what we are doing with our collaborators is asking, can we, in the breast cancer patients, rescue them from high-dose chemotherapy with their own cancer-free stem cells and now add CAR T cells or TILS or anti-47 when the tumor burden is 100,000 cells rather than at the diagnosis of metastatic breast cancer, you have 10 to 100 billion cancer cells in the body. Nobody should forget that quantitation, that if you want to use combination chemotherapy and then combination immunotherapy, you want to do them simultaneously if you can, or you do one combination, and then as soon as you can, another. And amongst the combinations, I am pretty sure you will find CAR T cells that couldn't take care of a whole large tumor, but now could be effective if there's just 100,000 cancer cells left in the body. So we will be establishing a consortium of people in Europe and the US to do pure hematopoietic stem cell rescue. And with those groups, hopefully in Spain also, we will be able to add as a consolidation therapy with each of the different groups, CAR T or another drug or treatment to try to change metastatic breast cancer from what was an incurable disease, which unfortunately still is an incurable disease, to one where we can anticipate curing most of the patients. Perfect. Uh, thank you. We will finish here. Uh, thank you very much for your time and for your expertise and, and great answers. I think we we'll learned a lot from many things and a lot of uh, food, of, food for thought for the weekend. Okay. And again, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Take care. You too.